Good day, and welcome to this Gross Anatomy video podcast on the cranial nerves. As always, this is Dr. Stuart Ingalls. This podcast serves as a concise review of the 12 cranial nerves. If you're a student of my Gross Anatomy course, there shouldn't be any new information introduced to you that hasn't already been seen. The hope is that this review will serve to reinforce some difficult concepts and help you feel more confident as you head into the exam. On the off chance that you are not one of my students and have just happened upon this video by accident, well, I hope you find it valuable. This video serves as a whirlwind review of the cranial nerves and how to identify them as they rise from the midbrain and brainstem, as well as a review of the foramina through which they exit the skull. That may very well suffice for most of you, but if you are interested in a more in-depth review, there will be follow-up videos that will review each of these nerves in turn in greater detail. I'll provide links for you to get there. A quick note before we begin. All the material used in this video is either licensed through the Creative Commons or is considered part of the public domain. This means that it is completely free of copyrighted material and can be circulated without restrictions. So if you do find it useful, feel free to download and circulate it with my blessing. I've also included a link to the download of the PowerPoint presentation that this podcast is based upon, which can once again be distributed and used in whatever capacity you choose. So enjoy. In discussion of the nervous system, anatomists will refer to 31 pairs of spinal nerves and 12 pairs of cranial nerves. The distinction is in the location of the nerve cell bodies, the location from which they branch from the brain or spinal cord, and the point from which they exit the central nervous system. With spinal nerves, nerve cell bodies are typically located within the gray matter of the spinal cord or in the dorsal root ganglion just outside of the spinal cord. Axons enter or exit the spinal cord through 31 pairs of dorsal and ventral roots, respectively, and they exit the vertebral canal through the intervertebral foramen. With the cranial nerves, cell bodies are clustered in specific locations within the midbrain and brainstem, collectively known as nuclei, or in ganglia found inside the cranial vault. In all 12 instances, the nerves exit through specific foramina within the cranial floor. We'll begin with an overview of the cranial nerves branching from the ventral surface of the midbrain and brainstem. The nerves are numbered according to the location of their nuclei from cranial to caudal. There are numerous mnemonics used to remember the cranial nerves in their respective order, some cleaner than others. The one that stuck for me personally starts OOO to touch and fondle, and that's all I really feel comfortable sharing here. I'll leave the rest to your imagination. The first of the cranial nerves is the olfactory nerve. Very easy to find just on the underside of the frontal lobes between the gyrus rectus and the medial orbital gyrus. Next up is the optic nerve, which is best distinguished by the optic chiasm, a partial crossover of the left and right nerve tracts, just cranial to the stalk of the pituitary gland. More on this crossing over later. Now, the first two nerves are pretty clear cut. No one really struggles when remembering the appearance and location. It's the remaining pairs that students tend to struggle with, so let's focus carefully on each of these in turn. Cranial nerve 3 is the oculomotor nerve. It projects ventrally between the midbrain and pons and can be seen lying on the inferior surface of the mammillary bodies. In brain specimens with intact vasculature, the oculomotor nerve is further distinguished from its position between the superior cerebellar and posterior cerebral arteries. The trochlear nerve has the distinction of being the only motor nerve in the body that originates off the dorsal aspect of the central nervous system. That's why it's typically found wrapping medially around the cerebral peduncle to join the other cranial nerves ventrally. This is probably going to be the most difficult of all the cranial nerves to identify. First of all, because it's exceptionally thin, about the same diameter as a human eyelash. Not too surprising, really. I mean, when you think about it, its entire purpose is the innervation of a single, incredibly small muscle. Second, the trochlear nerve is firmly embedded in a fold of dura mater, forming the free medial border of the tentorium cerebelli which means that this nerve is often torn away from its origin and commonly missing from brain specimens. There should be no problems locating cranial nerve number five. The trigeminal nerve has a vast sensory and motor distribution and appears as a large branch stemming from the anterolateral surface of the pons. It's cut pretty short during brain removal, leaving a short stump on the brainstem, sort of resembling a rather fat T-Rex with those short stumpy arms. 
Although it also innervates only a single muscle, much like the trochlear nerve, the abducens nerve has a noticeably larger diameter and is not as difficult to identify. It also has a distinct origin from the furrow separating the pons from the medulla oblongata and can be easily seen lying flat on the ventral surface of the pons. The next five nerves are of distinct size and easily observed. The problem is that they share common origin points with each other and exit through identical foramina, which makes it difficult to distinguish one from another. Cranial nerve 7 and 8 branch very close to one another at the pontomedullary junction just lateral to the abducens nerves. The facial nerve is typically the more superior of the two, but looking at the stump of a removed brain, it's a bit difficult to distinguish which is more superior. If you hang around for the second part of the podcast, we'll be talking rather extensively about the complex branching of the facial nerve after it leaves the cranial vault, but its origin off the brainstem is simple enough. Lying just inferior to the facial nerve is cranial nerve 8, the vestibulocochlear nerve. This sensory branch starts more dorsally relative to the facial nerve, but again, this is rather difficult to discern from the ventral surface. Careful growth inspection of cranial nerve 8 shows that there are two sensory branches that form the nerve bound together. These are the vestibular branch and the auditory or cochlear branch. More on these branches in the second video. We move inferiorly along the medulla oblongata and find a collection of nerve roots that project laterally as three distinct nerves. Superiorly, a single root gives rise to cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal nerve. As the name implies, it serves structures forming the root of the tongue and the pharynx. Cranial nerve 10 is the vagus nerve. Unlike the glossopharyngeal nerve, the vagus has a broader origin off the lateral medulla. The term vagus means wanderer, which describes the distribution of this important cranial nerve. After exiting the skull, it branches extensively to supply the neck, thorax, and abdomen. Cranial nerve 11 is formed from a long nucleus that extends from the lower brainstem into the upper cervical spinal cord. Numerous roots project laterally to form the spinal accessory nerve, which projects superiorly to exit the central nervous system through the cranial foramen. Because of its extensive length, it's very difficult to remove enough of the brainstem to take all the roots of the spinal accessory nerve along with it. As a result, some of these inferior roots can be seen in the deep recesses of the vertebral canal through the foramen magnum. We conclude our discussion with cranial nerve 12, the hypoglossal nerve. The hypoglossal nerve again originates off the medulla, but more anteriorly than the last three nerves we discussed, between two prominent brainstem structures, the pyramid and olive. It appears as a short series of nerve roots that exit the skull and, as its name implies, supplies muscles along the inferior aspect of the tongue. Still with me? Great. We'll be turning our attention in a moment to identifying the foramina these nerves exit through, but first, a review of what we just discussed on a couple of brain specimens. The one on the left has done a wonderful job of preserving most of the cranial nerves, while the one on the right shows the relationship of some select nerves to the vascular supply. Looking at this image on the right also gives some perspective on how difficult it is to keep all of these structures intact. Notice the prominent olfactory and optic nerves projecting ventral to the brainstem. The oculomotor nerve, which, as you can see on the right, passes between the superior cerebellar and posterior cerebral arteries, and the trochlear nerve projecting from the back of the brainstem. Trigeminal on the lateral aspect of the pons, abducens from the anterior pontomedullary junction, the facial and vestibulocochlear nerves along the lateral aspect of the pontomedullary junction, the glossopharyngeal, vagus, and spinal accessory nerves exiting lateral to the olive, and finally the hypoglossal between the olive and pyramidal tract. Now that we've covered nerved origins off the brainstem, we can turn our attention to how each of these nerves branch exits the skull. All right, this sounds much scarier than it actually is. Keep in mind that a number of branches exit through the same foramina, and it's no coincidence that the cranial nerves are numbered in such a way to group these nerves together. If you list the foramina in an ascending order according to how the nerves pass through, it should make it easier to remember. First is the cribriform plate, the porous roof of the ethmoid bone found just lateral to the crystagalli. 
The olfactory bulb rests on top and its nerve branches course through to reach the superior mucosal lining of the nasal cavity. Posterior to the cribriform plate are two small round foramen associated with the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. These are the optic canals, which allow for passage of the optic nerve. Lateral to these foramina are the much larger superior orbital fissures. This is sandwiched between the greater and lesser wings and allows for passage of the oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal, and abducens nerve to reach the orbit of the eye. So, fantastic. Three foramina listed and six nerves down, right? Well, not quite. You see, the trigeminal nerve has those three separate branches and each leaves through separate foramina. Only the ophthalmic, or V1, branch leaves through the superior orbital fissure. The maxillary division exits through the rounded foramen rotundum, while the mandibular branch exits through the oval-shaped foramenal valley. As many as you know, I'm pretty big on mnemonics, and here I like to use the term standing room only to remember the order in which the trigeminal nerve exits the skull. We can now move to the last six cranial nerves, and fortunately, only three foramina left. The facial and vestibulocochlear nerves exit through the internal acoustic meatus found in the petrous portion of the temporal bone. Note that the vestibulocochlear nerve terminates entirely within the inner ear cavity of the petrous bone. Only the facial nerve continues its path to the face, emerging through the stylomastoid foramen on the underside of the skull. The glossopharyngeal vagus and spinal accessory nerve all exit together through the jugular foramen, which is why each is found in such close proximity to the jugular vein in the superior region of the neck. Not too far away from the jugular foramen is the hypoglossal foramen, which accommodates passage of the twelfth and final hypoglossal nerve. So we now have covered the foramina using a dry skull model, but you are probably thinking to yourself that this looks nothing like what you saw after removing the brain. This is because the cranial base is covered in a layer of adherent dura mater in a wet specimen that each of the cranial nerves must pierce before exiting the skull. And identification is complicated by the fact that the cranial nerves may pierce the dura as much as an inch or more away from the exiting foramina. So let's take another look using a model of the skull with intact dura to identify what remains of the cranial nerves once the brain has been removed. Here's an image drawn by famed German anatomist Johann Sabata from around the turn of the 19th century. On the left, the dura is mostly intact, while the dura on the right has been partially reflected to give further detail for some of the cranial nerves. The olfactory nerve is pretty much toast, as the bulb typically comes away with the brain. Occasionally, the first cranial nerve breaks along the neural projection, and the bulbs are left intact with the cribriform plate. So we'll place shadowing here to represent that. The optic nerve is where we would expect it, in close proximity to the optic canal, although we don't have the advantage of the optic chiasm as a marker, as this is typically taken away with the brain. Here's where things start to get interesting. Notice the location at which the oculomotor, trochlear, and trigeminal nerves dive into the dura mater on the right. This is well back from the location of the superior orbital fissure. No wonder it's so difficult to visualize their exit from the skull. We only see a very small portion of these branches at the base of the cranium. The case is even more extreme for the abducens nerve. I mean, based on the point at which it pierces the dura, you'd think it more likely that it passes through the foramen magnum just by looking at it. Peeling away the dura from the right side, Sobata gives us a better view of the true courses of these nerve branches. Here again, we see the oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal, and abducens nerves in all their glory as they pass through the cavernous sinus of the skull on their way to the superior orbital fissure. And in the case of V2 and V3, the foramen rotundum and ovale. And yes, as usual, these images make things look far more crisp and clean than what you would see following a standard dissection. If you had the pleasure of dissecting out the cavernous sinus, I'm sure that your trigeminal nerve is frayed and your trochlear nerve and abducens nerve are MIA. Don't feel bad. These artistic impressions are the equivalent of the magazine covers of Vogue and Cosmo, creating unrealistic standards of body image through the magic of Photoshop. So don't let the likes of Sabata and Netter get you down regarding your own attempts at dissection.
We can pull up a second image depicting a transverse section through the cavernous sinus to give us a better perspective on the course of these nerve branches within the cavernous sinus. We can once again identify the oculomotor, trochlear, ophthalmic, and maxillary branches of the trigeminal and the abducent nerve. Note that this level is anterior to the foramen ovale, meaning that the medibular division of the trigeminal nerve, or V3, has already left the building. The final six nerve branches are more along the line of what we would expect based on the location of the foramina. We see facial and vestibular cochlear exiting through the internal acoustic meatus, the glossopharyngeal, vagus, and accessory exiting through the jugular foramen, and the hypoglossal exiting through the hypoglossal canal. So, if you are looking for a quick reference guide for identifying the cranial nerves coming off the brainstem and exiting through the cranial foramina, then you should be good. You may now return to your regularly scheduled social media programming. The next video in the series will consider each cranial nerve in turn for a better perspective on their specific branching patterns and function. Feel free to tune in. Until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.